I'd like to thank the Cambridge Forum for inviting me and, and all of you for coming. Uh, my work on uh, issues around climate change really begins in the late 1990s when I was a consultant to most of the big environmental groups in the country. And at the time, uh, Ted and I were being hired to promote a series of very frightening reports about the impacts that uh, higher temperatures would have in places like California and elsewhere. And we, uh, Ted and I would sort of, he was a pollster at the time and I was doing media campaigns. And we would routinely kind of come together and sort of talk about how the work was going and, you know, often over a bottle of grappa um, uh, to get our spirits going. And around then, we sort of started to realize that these uh, kind of constant debates about the science of climate change weren't doing much to actually help us to advance a policy agenda. And um, a, a few years later, actually, we, we stumbled across a bit of research that was commissioned by the founder of CNN, Ted Turner, who's also a, a, a very prominent environmental philanthropist. And he, uh, sort of looking to help Al Gore to make climate change an issue in the 2000 elections, he hired a group of cognitive sci scientists and psychologists to figure out how people reason about climate change, uh, called the Frameworks Institute. And what they did is they showed uh, videos of various climate change disasters to ordinary voters, and hurricanes, floods, all the kind of biblical uh, disasters I think we're all familiar with. This was, again, keep in mind, six years before An Inconvenient Truth. And the, uh, the, then they did focus groups to figure out how people responded to all this evidence about climate change. And I'll read you, this is a, a report that we stumbled across that was really created for the environmental community. Uh, one of the cognitive scientists said, uh, quote, the layering on of dire consequences, in fact, reinforces, reinforces that this problem is too big to address. Instead of supporting increased cafe or fuel economy standards, for example, they are likely to buy an SUV to help them through the erratic weather to come. Um, uh, and you know, meanwhile, Ted and I had been looking at the polling data, and we discovered there really hadn't actually been any big change uh, in public attitude since the late 80s, when, uh, as a high school student, I certainly became aware of, I think most Americans started to sort of see a connection between uh, things like global climate change, industrial pollution, and rainforest destruction. Um, a, a couple years went by, in about 2002, a very good, uh, now retired professor of physics at NYU named Martin Hoffert uh, and a group of other very prominent energy experts wrote a review of energy technologies that are needed for stabilizing the climate. Uh, and it was an article published in the journal Science. And we, we, we stumbled across it because Andy Revkin at the New York Times had written an article about it. And what Hoffert concludes at the end of it, he kind of goes through the radical technological change that's needed to power human civilization without uh, creating greenhouse gas emissions. And he concludes that uh, this is really not the work of, of pollution regulation. This is really the work of investment. And this was, you know, of course, just a few months after 9-11, where a lot of people were starting to make the connection between our oil consumption, the support for terrorism by uh, petrostates and, and, and by, oil, uh, by oil sheiks. And we then uh, decided with a group of others to start an initiative that really would be framed much more centrally around economic opportunity. So we started something called the Apollo Alliance in 2002 and 2003, where the idea was fairly straightforward. It said, look, this is a major technological challenge. We need to deal with it like we've dealt with other technological challenges, and that's through a big public investment in R&D and government procurement of promising new technologies. And we were very excited about it. We, uh, you know, we took it to all of our friends in the environmental community. We took it to all the heads of the, of the green groups. And you know, most of them sort of said nice things for their public relations. Uh, but then uh, Bush started to move his energy bill through Congress. And our green colleagues got very nervous that uh, somehow our little Apollo uh, project legislation would uh, hurt their efforts to kill the, the Bush energy bill. So they asked us to actually you know, remove or, or, or get rid of the Apollo legislation in Congress, and we spoke with the sponsor to do that. But it left a, a kind of a sour taste in our mouth. The Bush energy bill passed anyway. <laughs> um, and uh, we, were, we were kind of left with this feeling that really uh, the, the focus so overwhelmingly on pollution regulations, on cap, what gets called cap and trade, was really misplaced. And there was something that environmental groups weren't really dealing with when it came to the politics of climate change. And that was this sort of overwhelming focus on the need for economic sacrifice to avoid apocalypse rather than on a framework of investing in economic uh, innovation, 
and opportunity in order to create jobs and really create whole new industries in the United States that could uh, really grow our way out of both an economic uh, stagnation and also out of a climate crisis. Um, so about a year later in 2004, Ted and I were invited to speak at a conference of environmental grant makers. We, we proceeded to interview all of our uh, former environmental colleagues, the heads of the big green groups, and we you know, were just shocked by the degree of not only just un, in, in, you know, in curiosity and, and lack of interest, but also real resistance to thinking differently at all about a policy agenda. The, the dogma at the time, and it's breaking down a bit now, is that this is all about putting a price on carbon dioxide pollution. So you hear people say, a price on carbon. We have to have a cap, people say. We have to have, that's the only way that this is going to happen. In fact, there wasn't even really a debate at the time. It was just, this is the only approach, and anybody who says it's not is somehow somehow uh, an ally of, of Exxon or George W. Bush um, and is in some way or another suspect. So uh, we wrote in this essay, we sort of said, look, you know, if that's environmentalism, then that needs to die and we need a new politics that is really oriented very differently. And so we, we quoted a lot of philosophers and really wanted to make that essay into something more than just like we need a different policy agenda, but really we need to rethink our whole framework. And we really honestly didn't know what that was yet in 2004, uh, but really then spent, uh, while working on Breakthrough the next couple of years, trying to get clear both about what a policy agenda would look like and also what a kind of underlying philosophical framework might be. Um, and the question we kept asking was, why is it if this is a strategy that the greatest energy experts in the world say can't work from a policy perspective, and if uh, it's so obviously failing politically, why do green groups keep pursuing it? That was one of the questions that we wanted to know in Breakthrough. We wanted to get at what are the underlying psychological and philosophical assumptions uh, that are motivating this. Um, and the book really begins with the, a fairly basic uh, observation that the modern environmental movement emerges at a period of great prosperity. It comes at the late 60s, at a period of tremendous economic growth in the United States, um, at a time where uh, people had gotten their basic material needs met, and they were starting to be concerned about what uh, social psychologists, social scientists call sort of higher needs or what are called post-material needs, things like one's own self-realization, having meaningful work, pursuing one's unique self, and also caring for the larger world around them, a kind of global consciousness and a kind of ecological consciousness. Um, and of course, it also gave rise to a number of very good environmental laws that uh, were wildly successful, uh, air and water laws that cleaned up the air and, and the water, rivers and streams. And then in 1990, uh, really during the whole 80s, there was rising concern around acid rain, and a law was passed in 1990, it was an amendment to the Clean Air Act, uh, that created a cap and trade system for sulfur dioxide pollution, which was causing acid rain. And it was, uh, seemed a little complicated at the time, but it's pretty easy to understand Every firm that emits sulfur dioxide would have a set of pollution permits or allowances that would then reduce uh, every year in a steady manner. And if, if you couldn't reduce your own emissions in your own power plant, then you could purchase somebody else's emissions reductions at a price. And so it would create a market for emissions reductions. And that became uh, one of the core frameworks behind the global approach to uh, dealing with climate change and, of course, the United States approach. The other model that was very powerful was the Montreal Protocol in 1987, which uh, phased out the use of chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, which were destroying the ozone layer. And it was, again, a very successful treaty. A uh, number of nations in the world uh, implemented it. And, uh, and while there's still some implementation challenges, it has basically worked well. And so when global warming sort of emerges in popular consciousness in the late 1980s with James Hansen, the NASA scientist testifying in front of the Senate, uh, there was already a policy framework in place, one that was really largely unquestioned in part because it had been so wildly successful. Well, I think we're all familiar that in the next, over the next, really over the 20 years from 1988, which was Hansen's testimony, and 2008, global emissions have gone up faster than they had gone up in the prior uh, 100 years, uh, largely because of all the new developing economies coming online. China famously was building uh, two, two coal-fired power plants a week. India was uh, also expanding uh, into coal. Um, and the effort to, uh, to have a kind of global agreement on climate change, the Kyoto Protocol, uh, was 
adopted by a number of European countries as well as Japan and Canada, but was never implemented by them. Uh, they, uh, they took kind of half measures, but what we've seen in Europe is in fact the non-implementation of their cap and trade system. Um, and I want to say something more about that, but just to give you a, a sense of context of kind of the challenge, uh, over the next 40 years, between now and 2050, the world is going to triple and maybe quadruple its consumption of energy. And for the most part, that's a good thing because that will mean living standards are going to improve in places like China and India where people just don't have enough to live and even uh, basic, uh, uh, have basic well-being. The challenge, obviously, is that uh, scientists tell us, and there's sort of a global agreement on this, that we need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by half over that same period of time. So we need to triple energy consumption and reduce our emissions by half. And so that's going to require a major technological effort. In fact, it's such a large technological effort that um, the experience of actually de of interviewing energy experts, people often talk about how sobering it is to interview climate experts who are genuinely scared of, uh, of the, the risks of climate change. But when you interview energy experts, it's really one of exasperation. They really think people have, they're really always struck by the naivete that people have about transforming a global energy system. And in fact, in December of 2007, when the world met uh, in Bali, through the United Nations Conference on Climate Change, uh, a little-known uh, non-governmental uh, non organization called the International Energy um, Agency, which is sort of the world's preeminent uh, energy uh, an analysis uh, organization, came out with, uh, they, wanted to, they presented to diplomats what it would actually take uh, to reduce emissions 50% by 2050. And I'll, I'll just uh, run through their list. They, they gave a presentation. They said, they said the first thing that you've got to do is, and they said, you know, look, you don't have to agree with any of these technologies, but uh, just to give you a sense of the scale, these are the kinds of technologies that are available now that you would need to implement. They said you would need to uh, build 30 new nuclear power plants. And keep in mind that we haven't built a new one here in the United States uh, since the late 70s. Uh, you would need to build 17,000 wind turbines. Keep in mind that, you know, they're having a hard time just building it. Uh, a few dozen off the coast of Cape Cod because of the, the powerful resistance from the Kennedy family and other families there. 400 biomass power plants, uh, which are still really only in demonstration uh, phase. They said you'd have to build two hydroelectric power plants the size of the Three Gorges Dam in China. I don't know if you've ever seen the Three Gorges <laughs> Dam in China, but it's in a, it makes the Hoover Dam look small in comparison. They've been building it for about 50 years. Um, it's taken, you know, they've had to, they had to, I think they had to move like o over a million people. Um, they said you'd also have to construct 42 coal or natural gas power plants that, that sequestered the emissions or what they call captured and stored the emissions underground or under the oceans uh, so that they wouldn't go into the atmosphere. And they said you wouldn't do this once, you'd actually have to do this every year from 2013 to 2030. Um, and it really was a sobering, I think, presentation for folks who felt like, well, we just got to put a cap in place. It's very straightforward and have it go down every year by 2%. Um, uh, you know, in, in Europe, a lot of us, uh, certainly I was for a long time, sort of uh, kind of came to believe that Europe was really far ahead of us. Well, they have indeed put in place a cap and trade system. It's called the Emissions Trading Scheme. Um, but every country in Europe has seen its emissions rise, at least until this current recession, except for Germany and Britain. They reduced their emissions between 1990 and 2005 for reasons that had nothing to do with global warming. Uh, Germany reunified and the East German economy, like all post-communist economies, collapsed and they took their dirty uh, coal-fired power plants offline and they uh, proceeded to pack them up and then sell them to China. Uh, which was happy to purchase them. Um, and Britain saw its emissions also decline because Margaret Thatcher wanted to break the coal miners' union in the late 80s, and, they, and a whole set of North Sea uh, natural gas became available, and so Britain switched to natural gas. So Europe is going to meet its, uh, its, it's going to say that it's met its Kyoto targets by purchasing what are called carbon offsets, which are emissions reductions. Uh, done by others in other parts of the world, which I'll talk about in a minute and why they're so problematic, especially since they're uh, part of the current cap and trade proposal in, in the House. Um, but the, the bottom line from all of it was there's a, there's a fundamental political economy of carbon problem here, which is that people are just overwhelmingly against raising energy prices by very much. 
to deal with climate change. They might raise them a little bit here and there, but for the most part, raising energy prices is wildly unpopular politically. And we've known this for 20 years now. In fact, when California, where I live, was going through its budget crisis most recently, uh, uh, they, were, they were looking at all these different ways to raise taxes. Raising taxes on gasoline <laughs> uh, were the least popular of the approaches and got taken off the table. And so what we find is that there's a huge price gap between clean energy and fossil fuels. And this comes as a shock to folks in my world, but where I was sort of raised on Amory Lovins and this idea that no clean power is almost as cheap as fossil fuels. Well, unfortunately, it's just not the case. Uh, solar panels are at least five times more expensive than coal power, uh, wind um, at least three times as expensive. And the problem with all the renewables is that they're intermittent. So they only work when the sun is shining, the wind is blowing. So you have to pay for the cost of storage, and you also have to pay for the cost often of new transmission lines, which increase the costs. Um, and so while we find that Americans will say that they're willing to spend a little bit more to deal with global warming for their energy, they won't spend a lot more. And we find that, of course, in places like India and China, they're, at more, they're adamantly opposed to spending uh, much more on energy. In fact, they're quite explicit that they're not going to uh, cap their emissions in order to deal with global warming. But, you know, Ted and I both come out of sort of political analysis, and we also discovered a couple of other very interesting things about the way that people think about this. So if you ask people whether we should increase taxes on gasoline so people will drive less or buy cars that use less gas, what we find is that 68%, 68% of the public is against that idea 31% are in favor of it. That's sort of the Thomas Friedman approach. If you ever read Thomas Friedman in the New York Times, he says, oh, we just got to have a big price on carbon. We have to have a big gasoline tax. That'll, that'll do it. And the politicians just have to be more courageous. And, you know, I mean, to some extent, he's right. You know, politicians do need to be courageous. Of course, when they're courageous in ways that are wildly unpopular, they're, they're not going to be politicians for very much longer. Um, and so, so there is a reason why politicians pay attention to polling data. We found a different, if you ask the question differently, which is really asking about a different policy, you get a very different response. If you ask people, would you be willing or not willing to pay higher taxes on gasoline and other fuels if the money was used for research into renewable sources like, like solar and wind energy, we get 64% who say that they would. Um, and so in fact, you know, Obama knew this, which is why he spent most of the, the presidential campaign talking about how he wanted to spend 15 billion a year on investments in clean energy. Um, uh, to advance those technologies. And, and we, we've come up with a very simple way to think about this, which is that really the dominant pollution paradigm says that in order to deal with global warming, we have to make fossil fuels more expensive. We say you're never going to make them as, as expensive as clean energy is now. Um, what we need to do is make clean energy cheap. Well, what do we mean by that? Well, what we suggest is that there's actually a long history of of supporting technology innovation in this country and other countries. And you can see that really it's the only way that uh, we've, we've supported technology innovation. Um, you know, uh, a lot gets said in the environmental community about how regulations, that really forces companies to innovate. Well, the truth is that with, in case of acid rain, the sulfur dioxide laws, all the technologies that were needed to deal with acid rain existed before the law passed. They had cheap scrubbers which were easily attached to smokestacks. And they had low sulfur coal that became available from Wyoming and New, and New Mexico. And so really became very inexpensive uh, to deal with acid rain. In fact, I don't think most people even noticed a change in their electricity bills. Uh, that's a big contrast to the, the big price gap between fossil fuels and clean energy that I talked about. Now, in the case of the Montreal Protocol to deal with CFCs, very similar dynamic. In fact, they kept trying to negotiate a, a treaty globally, and it kept failing because they didn't have an inexpensive alternative to CFCs. By no means a, a widely used chemical, you know, it's in aerosols and in air conditioners, uh, air conditioning uh, uh, fluids. Um, and then DuPont uh, invented an alternative, and quickly the political momentum took place. So really what you find when you look at these regulations is that it's the technological breakthrough that precedes the political breakthrough, uh, not vice versa. And in fact, we even spent a little bit, you become, when you sort of get sucked into climate change, you end up becoming kind of a, an energy history nerd. We, we put it to a group of our advisors, can we think of any time in history that humans have moved from one older energy source to a newer energy source because we made the older energy source expensive? And we couldn't find a single example of that. In fact. Every time a new energy source has been moved to, it's because it's been cheaper, it's been more available, it's been more convenient, it's been uh, not because we made it 
the incumbent source expensive. In fact, we point out that you know when uh, in after World War II, when the U.S. government decided that it needed to compete in the space race against the Soviet Union, which had launched Sputnik, it needed computers and it needed uh, cheap computers and cheap microchips. Well, did we have a cap and trade on typewriters? Um, we didn't. We had uh, government procurement of type of uh, oh, sorry, I mean, of of microchips. Microchips in the late 50s cost thousand dollars a chip. Uh, in less than 10 years, after very large Pentagon contracts guaranteeing their production and sale, the price came down to $20 a chip. And of course, now microchips are everywhere and have unleashed a, a really a riot of global prosperity. Uh, similar story with the internet. Uh, we did not put a tax on telegraphs or faxes uh, in order to get the internet. We just invented the internet. It was uh, done for, again, a military purpose. Uh, and of course, you know, invented by those. Uh, as we've been taught to believe by the Republicans, by uh, terribly incompetent government uh, workers and bureaucrats. Uh, of course, that's the last we ever heard of the internet. Hasn't done anything for anybody at any anywhere. Um, uh, and yet there's a dogma that persists among environmental communities. So when our book came out and we made this argument, uh, the lead lobbyist for the NRDC, which is probably the most influential environmental group in Washington, his name is David Hawkins. He said, Nordhaus and Schellenberger are wrong in claiming that a big government funded program is the critical missing piece to make the shift to clean energy happen. Or a, a very, uh, one of maybe the most high profile green blogger attacked us. He works at the Center for American Progress, which is the largest liberal think tank in the country. That same month he said, we have all the technologies we need, either in existence today or in the pipeline to make deep cuts in emissions over the next few decades if we have a real price on carbon. So in other words, we just need to have a price on pollution and all these technolo technologies will be available. Well, uh, about a year later, things started to turn around. So we found that in the summer of last year, the International Energy Agency came out with its report and they said, current levels of investment are very unlikely to achieve the sort of step change in technology that is needed, a massive increase in energy technology, is needed in the coming 15 years. Or uh, Secretary Chu, Obama's new energy secretary, uh, in February of this year told the New York Times that we need Nobel caliber breakthroughs in solar power, batteries, and biofuels in order to deal with climate change. And Brookings recently came out and said we need 20 to 30 billion a year. So things have started to change in the recognition that a price on carbon is not gonna get us what we need. But in order to really understand how to make those investments, those government public investments in the technologies, we have to understand a little bit of history um, about technology innovation. So as I mentioned before, these big breakthroughs in information technologies came thanks to government investments, mostly uh, thanks uh, to investments uh, through the military. Um, but it really, they even go back further than that. So in Silicon Valley, uh, near where I live, the fable that gets told to school children and to everybody else has been that really all of Silicon Valley came out of Bill Hewlett's garage. It was Bill Hewlett and his, uh, and his good friend Packard, they got together and they just started tinkering in their garage and then lo and behold, we have Hewlett Packard and Silicon Valley. Well, the history is actually a bit more complex than that. Um, Hewlett and Packard were actually hired by the uh, uh, Pentagon. They got very large contracts for their radios. In fact, HP probably wouldn't exist had it not been for those government contracts. The other mythology that we hear a lot is that this is, you know, that breakthrough technologies emerge from the work of lone inventors, you know, working by themselves. In fact, there's a lot of mythology about this. Or Bill Gates uh, famously said before he became a good, good guy, he famously said, um, uh, you know, the amazing thing about Microsoft, he was very defensive because he was being sued by the Clinton Justice Department at the time. He said, uh, you know, the amazing thing about Microsoft is that we did it all without any government help. Um, in fact, that opening, that's an opening quote to a really terrific uh, academic article called uh, DARPA Does Windows, uh, DARPA being the Defense Advanced Research Applications uh, uh, Laboratories, which are famous for hiring the best and the brightest to oversee Technology innovation, of course, all of the major applications, the Windows, the mouse, the Ethernet, the Internet, of course, all were invented by government workers or government-funded R&D labs. Um, and then, of course, the most prominent one 
um, is that the government shouldn't pick winners and losers. We get this repeated to us all the time, um, by, not by right-wingers, uh, though certainly by our, our conservative friends, but, but by our fellow environmentalists. They say that all the time. Government shouldn't pick winners and losers. And we're like, really? Like, is that how VCs do it? In fact, when you ask venture capitalists how they do their work, they say, they say look, you, know, you just got to be, be able to handle a lot of failure. You know, they're like, if we invest in 20 projects and one of them hits it big, we've succeeded. That's the attitude from the private sector. They don't have an attitude that we shouldn't pick winners and losers. That's uh, uh, pure uh, dogma that um, really has no bearing whatsoever on the history of technology innovation. In fact, I was at a conference uh, with a group of very thoughtful conservatives and free, you know, free market libertarians. And one of them, and, and liberals like myself, and one of them uh, made the case that, uh, that he said, well, look, you know, proof that the government can't do this as well as the private sector is that Craig Ventner, who uh, cracked the human genome, you know, he cracked the human genome at the same time that NIH did, that the U.S. government did. And he was corrected by uh, a very good uh, historian from Pepperdine who was in the room, and he said, he said that's not true. All of Craig's computers uh, were funded by the federal government. And I know because I sat on the committees that funded the research into those computers. So even you sort of peel back a little bit of these big success stories and you find that the government really and government investment has already been there. In fact, Google itself received early funding from the Defense Department. So where does that leave us? Well, unfortunately, uh, while I think there's, fortunately, while I think there's been a shift um, in the environmental community away from the kind of apocalypse mongering, uh, which we know is counterproductive, and away from a kind of strict market fundamentalism, um, we still haven't uh, seen enough of a shift in Washington. And, and our view is that Washington is really the last place that changes. Right now, uh, Representative Waxman from uh, Los Angeles, actually from Hollywood, and Markey uh, from, is he from here? No, he's from near here. Um, they have a piece of legislation, they have a cap and trade legislation in the Congress, and I wish I could deliver good news about it. Um, unfortunately, most of it's bad. Uh, it would allow a third of all the emissions that firms are required to make to come from carbon offsets, which are, uh, have largely been shown to be bogus, if not in all, in all the cases, then in almost all the cases, because it's really quite impossible to determine whether somebody would have created emissions or not. So, for example, you go get by forest land in Brazil, and the landowner says, yeah, I was going to log this forest, but if you give me money, then I, if you pay me, I won't log it. Well, that'd be a little bit like you know, say, me saying to one of these firms, well, I was going to go to Hawaii you know, twice, and I won't go if you pay me. Um, you can't solve what's called the additionality problem. You can't determine whether those emissions reductions would be additional. And the worst part about it is that these carbon offsets would cost um, consumers about $25 billion a year, that's about what we should be spending on technology innovation. We think we should be spending somewhere more like 30 to 50 billion, but instead of it going into innovation, it would go to a lot of these, unfortunately, um, ill-conceived uh, projects. And, and obviously the worst part about it is that um, any of the money that gets raised out of cap and trade uh, would be really far too little to create the kind of transformative technological innovations that we need. Uh, both to make things like solar panels so cheap that they could just become like roofing tiles, you know, and just be part of the building materials that we need so that, uh, that so we can, you know, really rapidly move away from fossil fuels, or to support more kind of, uh, uh, I think, risky but promising ventures like vacuuming the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, which we now have demonstration level projects that are able to do, and storing them underground, um, which may very well be one of the ways that we deal with climate change. So in sum, I'll say that um, I'd say that this is a, a, a critical moment uh, for anybody who cares about a, a planet that's getting warmer and also a planet that is developing um, to really start to pay attention to what our lawmakers are going to do. Because I, I don't think that uh, what we hear a lot from our friends in Washington as well, you shouldn't worry too much. We can improve it later. The problem with the cap and trade legislation that's being uh, negotiated right now is that it would create so many vested interests who have an interest in doing many things other than reducing emissions or achieving the technological breakthroughs that we need, who would then become vested interests at the table and we believe would end up halting our ability to deal with this really critical challenge uh, in the years to come.
Thank you very much. You are joining us at Cambridge Forum, listening to Michael Schellenberger discussing Beyond the Pollution Paradigm. Uh, I'll perhaps start it with the first question, and others can, can go on from there. Um, essentially, the cap and trade uh, doesn't look like it's going to get through at least this year. And in fact, uh, according to your assessment here, probably isn't worth the candle, as it were. Um, but the implication you are leaving us with is that massive investment <coughs> from governments in new technologies is uh, the way to go. Is that it? Am I getting that correctly? Yes. I see. Well, what leads to much optimism about the downpike of that? In other words, it seems to me it's not addressing the issue either of consumerism or of self-imposed self-restraint. Uh, it merely says we can pull some other technological rabbit out of some other hat to keep things going as usual. Our, our, our view is that we're going to solve climate change by moving to power sources that don't create emissions and by managing our forests and agricultural areas so that they don't create excess emissions and, and likely also by finding a way to capture emissions and store them underground. And the, the, one of the chief objections we've heard from environmentalists has been, oh, well, you're just looking for a technological fix. You know, you just want a technological fix to global change. What we need is societal transformation. We need everybody to consume less. Cons consumption is the problem. Well, I have a couple of observations about that. The first is that I've traveled a fair amount in some fairly poor parts of the world. Um, the only people I've ever heard who suggest that consumption is a problem are the wealthiest people in the planet, um, which are, frankly, environmentalists. Uh, who suggests that our problems are due to consuming too much. I mean, isn't that ironic that it's the, actually the people that are consuming the most who think that the problem of global warming is a problem of, of overconsumption. In fact, I would suggest that one of the problems is that the poorest people on Earth are under-consuming, and they need to consume a lot more. Um, the second thing about it is, what a funny, why is it that we get the objections to technological fixes to environmental problems? In other words, when we had a polio epidemic, I don't think we heard a lot of people saying that we needed to just shut down the swimming pools. I and mean, we, we, if we shut down the swimming pools, it was considered a bad thing because kids couldn't go swimming. We did it temporarily. We never suggested that we needed to have some radical lifestyle change in order to deal with polio. Or no one suggests the same thing with malaria or cancer. Um, really, what we get is a, a huge amount of support for all sorts of technological fixes. Um, so I think we have to question this intuitive and ask ourselves, what is that about? Why is it that we would see consumption as part of the problem? Well, I think one of the reasons, obviously, is that environmentalism itself has always had a fairly dark view of human power and human agency on the planet. So we find in the early narrative, Silent Spring, all the way to Paul Ehrlich in 1968, to Al Gore, the story is that humans are really a contaminant of nature, that the problems that we're having are a violating nature, and that these environmental problems are a kind of revenge by nature on us. And in fact, if you read An Inconvenient Truth, you'll find all sorts of biblical story. You know, he'll, Gore will say, um, you know, these things take time, but there will be a day of reckoning. Well, the idea is that these things are punishment. And, but I think there's also something else that happened, which is that I think environmentalism uh, really comes at a moment when there's a lot of status anxiety among wealthy uh, American liberals, and we're becoming a more unequal society over the last 20 years. And I think one of the ways that we expressed our status is through a kind of green consumption. So in fact, if you look at the plethora of green products, of, of green advertising, it's really aimed at the elites. It's really an idea, this is gonna set you apart. In fact, when they interview Prius owners, uh, the number one reason that people said they wanted to buy a Prius is because they wanted people to know that they were driving a hybrid. And in fact, it was such a successful car in comparison to the other hybrids that the Honda Civic uh, has actually redesigned their car so it looks like the Prius, a kind of triangular shape. Um, so I frankly find it chilling when I hear it. I hear it all the time. We don't have enough planet Earth to go around. Um, those, are, those are the sentiments of affluent Environmentalists, so I think, have a, and I think it's, I think the consequences of that kind of thinking are actually quite dark, um, and I, I think we should, we should really kind of 
catch ourselves when we make those. I, I, don't, I don't believe uh, that Greens, who have been concerned about climate change, have massively reduced their carbon footprints. Uh, one of my, a friend of mine is a, a, a very good historian in New York. He spent a year trying to live a, a low impact life. And what was, his book is coming out in the fall. It's called No Impact Man. And, um, and what I observed when I read this book is that all of the changes that they made to their lifestyle in order to reduce their emissions were changes were, 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 that were positive for the fam family. In other words, there was actually technological alternatives. So they talked about how they, they rode their bikes. They were in New York City. They rode their bikes instead of driving or taking cabs or even the subway. Well, they really liked that. It's nice to ride your bike. Um, they started uh, doing less takeout. I don't know if you guys, you know, all my friends in Manhattan, they live on takeout, you know. Um, they, started, they started making their own meals and having family meals, and they really liked that. Well, then they tried washing their own clothes in the bathtub, and it was a complete disaster. They hated it. They didn't want to do it. They tried it once. They didn't want to do it anymore, so they, they carved out that exception. And I think that's, there's a very powerful lesson there. I think we're willing to make very modest behavior changes. We'll, we'll sort the recycling you know, we'll, 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 we'll set the washing machine on cold rather than on warm or hot. Um, but we're not going to give up our civilization. We're not going to give up our hospitals, our sewage systems, uh, our infrastructure uh, in the name of preventing apocalypse. And, and we don't need to. And, and I think that taking the conversation to that level is actually a massive distraction from the, the policy and political changes that are required. I agree with you totally that government investment is is the way to, um, is a route to, um, I'm, I'm not sure about the whole bury the carbon in the, in the earth thing, if, if that actually is a workable idea. Mm -hmm. And I'd be interested to know why people think this would work. Okay. Um, but the first question was on really an uh, adaptation. Am I right? Right. Sort of I mean, adapting um, to climate change. I, I guess I guess I'm sort of a, the apocalypse um, um, viewpoint that um, you know the chances are that we've already reached the tipping point and we're going to be building the dikes regardless. But thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, I think the first thing to acknowledge is that the world is getting warmer. It's going to continue to get warmer because there's this lag between when the emissions go into the atmosphere and when the warming takes place. Um, so the world is going to get warmer no matter what. Um, and it could get a lot warmer. It could get a little bit less warm. It depends on a number of variables. But either way, we have to prepare uh, for and, and adapt to a warmer world. Um, so that... I think it had historically, until recent years, had been viewed as an excuse to do nothing by a lot of folks. I think that's now starting to go away, um, which is, I think, a positive development, so that even Al Gore recognized that he had been wrong to criticize adaptation. So I think on the broader, whether or not dikes um, are the right solution for rising sea levels, um, I think that we need to have you know, comprehensive strategies to deal with a warmer world, which includes you know, more intense, more frequent uh, hurricanes, forest fires, droughts, and the like. Um, you know, in terms of the apocalypse, the reason that uh, the apocalypse uh, frame doesn't help us here is not just because it has counterproductive effects, because it certainly does that. There's extensive research showing that, you know, the more apocalyptic we get, the more alienated most of the public actually gets from a kind of energy technology agenda, and, and certainly from a cap-and-trade agenda. Um, but there's another reason it doesn't work, which is that in the, in the apocalyptic view, everybody's, the world is ending for everybody equally. Um, so, uh, you know, I was, just at, I was at the laundry, doing my laundry a couple of weeks ago, and I, these two guys were talking about how the Mayan calendar says that in 2012, the world's going to end. You know, and I sort of noticed, they, all, they got so, ex I, was, I was struck, I was listening to them, I was like, they don't seem sad about it at all, <laughs> you know? It wasn't like, oh, you know, the world's going to end in 2012, so, you know... I'm quitting my job today, you know. Um, there, were, there was sort of a thrill to it. Um, and, and, but I think the important thing to keep in mind here is that global warming is going to have different effects on different people. The most vulnerable people on Earth will be disproportionately impacted. And not only that, but just in, 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 the, in the world of cosmic injustice, the most impacted places will be Africa, which already suffer from a disproportionate number of droughts. In fact, you know, um, agriculture, uh, agricultural yields may in fact increase uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, at least in some places. 
Um, so the problem with all those apocalyptic scenarios is that the wealthiest people on earth will be much better at navigating them and, and preparing for them than the poorest people. Um, and, and the other dilemma it creates is that, the, you know, that of course, when the, the, the United Nations and others talk about we have to avoid dangerous levels of climate change, dangerous levels of, you know, dangerous uh, climate impacts. Well, the climate is already very dangerous for the poorest billion people on Earth. Um, and so when we think about adaptation and development, one of the, the key things here is that in order to be prepared for global warming, you have to be a much wealthier society. You need houses that don't blow away in the wind and the rain. You need uh, infrastructure. Um, and that means uh, energy. And right now, uh, that energy is overwhelmingly going to come from fossil fuels because they're so inexpensive and they're everywhere. So those two things, I think those adaptation, mitigation questions are really much more interlinked than I think we often, we often, we often believe. Hi. Uh, what's your opinion on uh, how the government should spend or you know, invest in various kinds of research sort of projects? In your opinion, what would you say you know, the split should be, where should we focus in terms of new sources of energy? Um, in fact, we have a white paper that will be coming out called uh, Making Clean Energy Cheap uh, in the next couple of weeks, and you can get that from our website, which is just thebreakthrough.org. So our, our view is that you need to fund all phases in the innovation process. Innovation is uh, nonlinear. Um, it's uh, often not predictable. Which is why all you know, which is why the models, all of the models, on sort of the economy and on technology are, are invariably going to be wrong. They have to be wrong because we have no idea. We have we have very little idea we, what breakthroughs will happen when and how. Um, so I think we we propose somewhere around uh, 30 uh, billion for R and D, um, or really, really 20 to 30 for R and D. Uh, some portion of that going to early stage demonstration projects, and then really the rest going to government procurement, government contracts to just buy expensive but promising technologies to, to buy down the price like we did with microchips, um, and also through uh, deployment, you know, actually uh, funding the deployment of, 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 of promising energy sources. We think that the key thing is that you don't put all your eggs in one basket, since we don't know exactly which energy sources are going to be the cheapest. So we favor um, funding stuff that I think a lot of people in Congress would say, well, that's just, uh, that's, you know, that's uh, pork, or that's, they're giving the Golden Fleece Award, and really, really um, we, we think that if you want to support innovation, a whole bunch of different promising technologies need to be supported, and, and not just renewables, and not just the ones that we have. Um, you know, because I think that what the energy experts that we talk to, uh, they think that you need both uh, basic level breakthroughs in terms of the physics and the chemistry for solar panels, for example, in the case of physics or, or chemistry in the case of batteries to get, you know, really cheap and inexpensive batteries and also get really cheap and inexpensive solar panels. At the same time, you can get a lot of cost reductions by just deploying and learning and, and figuring out how to, how to make these things a lot cheaper. So the classic example there is that Denmark uh, knew that if they were able to build wind turbines that were very large offshore where there was much more wind, they would be much more efficient than the little kind of bird blenders, you know, that the older windmill, uh, the older windmills really were, which they're much lower to the ground, the blades turned much faster. And I had an argument with Bjorn Lomborg, who's, a, uh, who, who's actually not a skeptic, but is a critic of Kyoto. And, and he said, I said, well, Bjorn, you know, your country, he's from Denmark. I was like, you know, you... <laughs> I was like, you guys really pioneered these, these big, cheap windmills, and you did it because you just started investing in them. He said, oh, well, he said, I have no problem with the big windmills. It was just all the little ones we built up until then. <laughs> and a friend of mine I told that to, he said, that's like complaining to the hardware store. You don't, you don't want the ladder with all the bottom rungs. You just want it with the top rungs. <laughs> so my view is, is really a portfolio approach, a lot of different investments at all stages of the innovation process. Cool. Well, we're proposing that it really be divided among different institutional entities. So um, we think DOE uh, needs to have some responsibility here. In the white paper that we're coming out with, we're proposing something called a National Institutes of Energy, modeled after the National Institutes of Health, mm -hmm. which also saw a big increase in their budget uh, to you know, create new pharmaceutical drugs. Um, and then there's a, certainly a proposal out there for, for an ARPA energy modeled after DARPA.
that we think is promising, you know, hiring the best and the brightest to serve for a couple of years as, as program officers. Um, but I, uh, uh, in that paper, um, we do not get, I, I think that the error sometimes is actually deciding in advance which technologies need to be supported. I think that there are, I think we need institutions with people that are capable of making those, those mm -hmm. decisions. What part of energy so-called conservation or efficiency, what part of pinpointing the technologies for the, for the people who need it the most are present in your plan? Because I don't hear them. Well, you don't hear them for a good reason, which is that we, we've recently started taking a deep dive in some of the claims of the radical efficiency folks, and have, uh, frankly, it's come up lacking for us. In other words, if you were to like get the whole world as efficient as Japan is, which is the most efficient developed country, it has the greatest energy efficiency of any developed country, you still need to move to zero power energy sources. In other words, you don't get you're not going to get to 50% emissions reductions by 2050, and nowhere, nowhere close to that through efficiency and conservation. Um, so, I mean, even if like we, you know, cut our emissions in half uh, to where Europe is, uh, which is a, a very challenging task, um, uh, we still have to get zero carbon energy sources. So, while you know nobody can be against efficiency because it pays for itself and you know, it's, it saves money and it's, it, it automatically reduces emissions. It's, it's not the main play. And I think it's been hyped for 30 years or 40 years or more um, by folks who really kind of go, well, no, here's this, these, these places that it really pays for itself. And it's, you know, and they kind of, they take, you know, they take a bunch of anecdotes and try to pluralize them into data. And the plural of anecdote is not data. Um, the world needs... Uh, cheap power, and it's going to get it from fossil fuels unless we have uh, inexpensive clean energy. Um, and there's just a huge number of barriers to, I mean, the, part of the reason that we can't get the big efficiency gains is there's a huge number of barriers that actually are non-economic barriers. So, for example, retrofitting a building, you know, the buildings, the people that are often, uh, that are working in the building aren't the same people that own the building. So you have to have a, a major retrofit, it requires really inconveniencing a huge number of your, of your tenants. Um, or the people that own the house or rent it have different interests. They might, you know, the people renting it might be paying the electricity bill uh, but not own the place and they don't want to make the investment for a small uh, reduction in their electricity prices if they're only going to be there for a little while. Um, I think it's notable that the big dramatic uh, efficiency gains in automotive have actually occurred through uh, government procurement and big government investment in R&D. You know, the story that people tell about the Japanese uh, hybrid car technologies are that, well, it's because Japan had higher fuel economy standards. Well, actually, what really happened is that Japan has long had a, a tradition of innovation uh, in each of these sectors of the economy, and they got to the hybrid because really Toyota and Honda and the Japanese government worked closely together to develop that technology, and then the government guaranteed the market for the early uh, hybrid cars. So, I mean, I kind of go, you know, on efficiency, it's like, to some extent, it's already happening. Um, should we have uh, greater incentives for efficiency? Sure. But my experience is that it's really been a distraction from uh, where I think the focus needs to be, which is how do we create uh, power sources that just don't pollute? How can advancing technology save us from ecocide when advancing technology is the major cause of ecocide. And if your answer is photovoltaics, then my response is you can't run a high-tech global economy on renewable energy technology, according to a world-leading ecologist who just wrote a book, but I, I forget the name of the book and his name. Right, I mean, you, every technology we create is gonna have unintended negative consequences. That's just part of being alive on this earth. I mean, uh, we, uh, there's a, a very good um, philosopher who wrote a, there's a book of academic responses coming out, to break, coming out about breakthrough, and, and, and he sort of, he points out that the, the story of Frankenstein, you know, we sort of misread that story as a cautionary tale against technology and against human hubris to create uh, a man, uh, to create, you know, the monster. Um, but he points out that really, the, the sin that Dr. Frankenstein committed was not in attempting to create this monster, but it was actually 
in abandoning it when he realized that it hadn't turned out just the way he wanted it to. And in fact, everything that goes wrong in that fable goes wrong because um, he was unprepared for and unwilling to accept some of the unintended consequences of his technologies. So my view is that, you know, we see it all the time. You know, early technologies uh, are uh, lacking in one way or another. And certainly the technologies that we're going to have to deal with, you know, that are zero emissions are going to have all sorts of problems that we're going to have to deal with. I think we'd be kidding ourselves if we thought that they wouldn't. Um, so we, we do the best we can. We manage those unintended consequences when they emerge. We create protocols, uh, safety measures. We have an active civil society that makes sure that corporations are not abusing their trust or their power. Um, but I don't, I don't think that the fact that technologies have unintended negative consequences is an argument against technologies. Uh, have, you, have you heard of the Transition Handbook by Rob Hopkins uh, from England? Or England? I haven't. Well, he, he completely disagrees with you. He doesn't think that, he thinks that other means other than advancing technology is going to uh, take us out of this. There's a lot of people who disagree with me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I have a sort of a couple of aspects of the, of the political side of the issue. Uh, one is, uh, putting it one way, uh, how do you get from the fact that you have some polling data that people are willing to pay a little more in gas tax to fund innovative technologies, how do you get from that to actually having Congress funded? Um, the other side of it is you seem to be dismissing efficiency um, and uh, pollution reduction. Now that, now that the public has sort of bought into that, um, why not take advantage of that as well? It doesn't seem to me it's a zero-sum game that you can either have pollution reduction or you have uh, investment in new technologies, but why not build on, on both? So on the, on the first question, it's actually relatively simple. So our, our view in terms of how do you create a policy framework to support the technology innovation that we support, we think that you need a cap and invest framework. It would be very straightforward. It would, uh, it would, set, a, it would set a price for carbon, probably a modest price to start with. Uh, we think somewhere, between, somewhere around $10 a ton of carbon dioxide pollution. And instead of trying to hide your efforts to contain the cost from going too high, which is what Waxman-Markey attempts to do through the use of offsets and borrowing from the future, we think it should be very transparent what that price is, because we think firms need to know, firms and governments need to know what that price is and, and how it will increase, um, uh, and it, that it should be steadily increasing over time uh, to provide some real predictability. That all of the pollution allowances that firms get should be purchased rather than given away, and at that low carbon price, um, that would raise about $60 billion a year. Um, uh, our proposal is to spend between 30 and 50 billion. I, I think I'd, I'd, feel, I'd feel safer <laughs> if it were at 50 billion. Um, and, you know, and maybe we need another 10 billion for uh, adaptation or to help low-income consumers. But the idea of having a low carbon price to start with is that uh, you're not gonna get a very strong public backlash. Um, $60 billion uh, a year is about $200 uh, per American, uh, which is far less than the estimates that we're seeing of what a cap-and-trade bill would cost. Of course, what the cap-and-trade eventually costs is, is entirely going to be determined by how they structure the allowances and the permits. Um, on the second question, the problem with the way that people have thought about efficiency and conservation is that it's, it's always been, oh, no, we need both and, but we actually never get to the second part of that equation. So we've really gone, you know, 20 years since James Hansen raised his, his concerns without ever having made a major commitment in terms of government investment in these new technologies. We spend about $3 billion a year now on energy R&D. That's less than Amgen, the biotechnology firm, spends on its own R&D. We basically spend nothing. On, on technology innovation in terms of energy. And the big oil companies spend almost nothing. In fact, Shell just announced it was going to withdraw um, future investments in solar and wind. Um, so you have a situation now where we're, like, so people always say, well, how do we know it'll work? We, we, you know, we've tried before. We actually have never tried. Um, 
And so I guess what I get worried about with the efficiency equation is that we get people like Amory Lovins and other efficiency gurus who go around touting these very extreme efficiency examples um, that are they're completely unrealistic, frankly, in terms of real world. They tend to be uh, folks who are enamored with models, with a particular kind of mathematical model, and, and don't actually look at how this stuff gets implemented in the real world. Um, so I, I'm, I, for one, I'm really quite impatient with all the delaying that's been done um, in the name of, well, we'll solve all this for efficiency and conservation. It just doesn't answer uh, the world's energy needs for the next 40 years. Please. Hi. I've got a lot of points I'd like to make. I'm an environmental regulator and have been an environmentalist, I guess, for many years. And I think the picture you paint of those of us who are so-called environmentalists is a bit off. Um, and I, I, I could go on. I'd probably rather do it over a beer after the meeting because I have a couple of more important points I think I'd like to make. There's a lot I disagree with, but part of what I do agree with is that the energy sector, I think, is really where the, the ball game is right now, not only in the United States but worldwide. If we don't do something about it very quickly, and I mean very quickly, we are going to have major problems. And I am a Jim Hansen acolyte. I just got his missive today. If anybody hasn't read it, uh, you should. It's a letter he's writing to the Secretary of Climate Change in Australia, which is the country that's probably right now most devastated by the consequences of uh, climate change. Um, and he makes a case um, for what he would call a carbon tax with a full rebate, um, as opposed to cap and trade. Now, down in Washington, the the, the Markey Waxman bill is clearly partly a cap and trade bill. It also has five or six major provisions, sections. It's, it's over 600 pages long. And many of those go to not just energy efficiency, but also investment in technology. Some of those sections, I, I would submit, are, are pretty good. I don't particularly like the, the cap and trade side of it for many of the reasons you've cited and others. As an environmental regulator, I would find it very, very difficult to try to verify, monitor, and enforce violations of, for example, meeting caps and complying with offset requirements. Although if they want to send me to you know, Africa to verify that a trade actually took place, I'm happy to do that as an environmental regulator. But I just don't think it's going to be workable. So the cap and trade approach has many flaws, but the, the Hansen model, which he outlines for the Secretary of, of Climate Change in Australia, I think actually is a workable model. But in his view, it, it needs to have the 100% rebate to the consumers in order to get them on board so that A, it passes in the first place, and B, they don't get pissed off about rising prices and have their politicians yank it back in five or 10 years. We don't have that luxury. If Hansen's right, we've got to get something in place with reductions in the range of 25% by 2020 and about 80% by 2050. We've got too much carbon loaded in the atmosphere right now, and we're looking at doomsday unless we act very, very quickly. He thinks the tax can be implemented quickly. I think it can as well. They're now doing it in British Columbia. Um, it's underway there. The Montreal Protocol, by the way, which you, I think, analogized to a cap and trade scenario, is in fact a tax, a rising tax that they had on those uh, gases that are in our air conditioning. Um, and it worked. Um, so I think it can work. And my question, sort of the larger question I have for you is, we're in such dire straits, why don't we try everything, including the, the cap and trade with a 100% rebate, which doesn't give you the money, the pile of money you just outlined that you would like to see invested. But I say, if we can invest $100 billion, $200 billion in failing banks, and we can come up with the money like you suggest we could when we had World War II, where 30% of GDP was invested in the war effort, if we moved anywhere near that today, we could afford both the 100% rebate, which buys you the political will to move forward with this program, 
and the kind of innovation in the energy sector that I think you want to see. Why can't we do both? Right. Well, the problem with the Hansen, there's two problems with the Hansen proposal. The first is that it's wildly unpopular. Um, it, it, when you actually do the research and you ask and you explain that proposal to people, it's actually less popular than cap and trade. If you tell them they're going to get hundreds of dollars back in yes. the range of 600 <laughs> they don't bucks actually, a year. People don't actually get, they kind of, first of all, they don't like it for the same reason that they didn't like the tax, which is that they don't actually want to be taxed to change their behavior. They're happy to pay a little bit more if it funds the technology innovation, but they really don't like, and I'll tell you, I mean, the other thing is that their disparate impacts of it is that everybody under that cap and, under that cap and dividend proposal will get the same amount of money back. Every, every American would get whatever, $2,000 a year, let's say. Well, the problem is, is that, like my, my cousins in Indiana, who frankly are not all that concerned about global warming, um, they get 92% of their electricity from coal. I live in the Bay Area, I get half of my electricity is hydro. So my electricity prices are not gonna go up anywhere close to how their electricity prices are gonna go up, and yet we're gonna get the same amount of money? How is that equitable? I mean, it's actually a highly regressive tax. It's, and, quite, and frankly, quite illiberal. Um, uh, so I, I think it's a bad, I think it's, I think it's sort of, it's bad politics and, and then it's bad policy both because of those uh, disparities, those regional disparities, for reasons that had nothing to do with global warming. I have hydroelectric power in my state and so does Washington state where people are also much more concerned about global warming than they are in Indiana and Ohio. Um, but the, the, the other problem is that, again, we do not, technology innovation has not occurred from this pricing approach. I mean, just look at the history of technology innovation. You won't find, we didn't move from earlier forms of energy technology to more advanced forms by pricing the incumbents out of the market. So I would ask, I would, the burden of proof should be on the advocates of the pricing approach to show how that pricing approach has actually caused technology innovation. The Montreal example that I gave you was actually a counterexample. They invented the technology before they had the political agreement. They needed the technology before they could get the political agreement. The same thing on acid rain. They had low cost scrubbers and low cost low sulfur coal before they could get an acid rate agreement in 1990. I'm not gonna argue with you about that, but I think it was the government regulation forcing the abandonment of the old gases that allowed them to pick up and use the slightly more expensive gases and innovate very quickly. The time frame, I think, is the, the difference between you and me. If you, we had all the time in the world, I think maybe your approach might work. We've got 10 years. Well, actually, with and, all due respect, for the last 20 years, the environmental community has been advocating your approach, and we've gotten nothing for it. It hasn't been implemented. Exactly. It's um, now we have in to have Congress a policy agenda. Year. We have to have a policy agenda that is popular enough to be implement to be to pass Congress and then to remain implemented. If they go and pass Waxman Markey in its current that. form, it's not going to create a, a high sustainable price for carbon, and it's not going to provide the funding that's needed for technology innovation. So, in other words, in in being stuck in the older pollution paradigm, what we get is we get the status quo. Um, for you know, for, we've had it. We've been doing this for 10 years. Kyoto was negotiated in '97, um, and it hasn't reduced emissions. Um, and we're going to get it for another decade if we implement that agenda. So, in terms of this question of delay, well, the delay, the people that have been actually responsible for the delay are the people who are stuck in this older, unworkable pollution paradigm, not those of us that are advocating technology innovation. I'll let somebody ask a question, then, and maybe if there's time, I'll come back. Hi. Um, first, uh, I want to say that I'm certainly in support of the idea of government funding uh, for research of, uh, you know, of new uh, innovative clean technologies, but what I take exception to, like some previous speakers, is the idea that that should be uh, the only or even the major focus um, these days. Um, you said that uh, technology precedes policy. Um, but that, that has not necessarily been the model that works. I think like a big counterexample has been the Clean Air Act uh, of 1970 with the technology forcing for automobiles where uh, they basically said the technology doesn't exist but we're gonna require you, the automobile industry, to reduce hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, and nitrogen oxides by 90% in five years, live with it. And 
Through catalytic converters, you know, you, right? Well, but there, there was no such thing as a catalytic converter. Yeah, you, you made the regulation, you made the policy, said the air, you know, is, is filthy, and this is one of the big sources, and it's up to you, automobile industry, to decide what you want to do. They could have gone electric automobiles, they could have gone any number of ways they invented the catalytic converter. My understanding is that those technologies were actually being developed and researched before that law passed. And the, and the catalytic converter is another great example. You didn't need to actually, they didn't reinvent the internal combustion engine in order to get the catalytic converter. Catalytic converters were cheap. They were really inexpensive. Uh, and then frankly, the other one was lead. You just removed it from the gasoline. So you get these major environmental improvements from really inexpensive technologies. The catalytic converters are cheap now. They were not that cheap then. They didn't exist then, and they, they were developed and implemented. Uh, you didn't have any cars. You couldn't buy a car with a catalytic converter before 1970. Well, no, but, well right. You couldn't, um, but the fact that it wasn't commercialized doesn't mean that the technology wasn't already in development. In other words, the, the, CF, the alternatives to CFCs were not being implemented, but they had had the technological breakthrough to get it before they passed the Montreal Protocol. And you're saying you don't think any technology currently exists, and therefore we have to fund it. Uh, I do that, that, think that the technology, I think that there are technologies that exist now, and they're much more expensive than fossil fuels. And so if you want to get fossil mm -hmm. fuels used by China and India, which are going to massively increase their energy consumption over the next 40 years, they have to get a lot cheaper first. Oh, let people continue. Hi. I just, I just came from a class about environmental uh, climate change, and the issue was brought up uh, how the media is dealing with this. And my question is really, uh, actually two questions. Is your proposal called Apollo Project? You mentioned... We no longer like the metaphor of Apollo, actually. And why, <laughs> why, why was it used? I need well, to it was used at the time because we wanted to inspire a sense of national ambition. Okay. Um, but we no longer really like it as a metaphor because, frankly, putting a man on the moon and bringing him safely back to okay. Earth is a pretty okay. easy yeah. engineering challenge. Yeah. Um, making, uh, getting these Nobel caliber breakthroughs that Stephen Chu says we need is actually really difficult. It's more akin to... Um, we think a better models are kind of post-Cold War investments in information technology and then post-Civil uh, War investments in railroads and then also just right. sort of early 20th century investments in agricultural sciences. Okay, so I understand that part. Uh, what I really want to go after is this. I, I've been around for a while and I have an impression that there are many technologies that are not discussed that were either stopped or bought up by the powers that be, let's call them. The reference I was making before to the media is, for example, we know that all the information that comes to us is totally controlled. So someone has real control over what information goes out and what does not. And if there is, is there, if there's an information blockade, let's assume for 60 years going on, if we are not addressing that issue, we won't make any progress. So I, I really think part of your... I'm just trying to understand the question. Is, it that, is there a sort of a conspiracy to hide well, the existence uh, of breakthrough low carbon technologies? I'm not talking about breakthrough and, and uh, carbon technology. I'm talking about uh, various other technologies that are not being sponsored by the people that run the power industries. Are you aware of that? Or, uh, yeah, no, there's, I mean, there's also without amazing... Calling, without calling it conspiracy no, theories. I, I think that there are uh, really amazing innovators and entrepreneurs who should be funded to That's do I mean, their research your, and demonstration so, that are not being funded, but it so doesn't have much your, to do with the media. I mean, no, but, well, I follow for a while, I believe that uh, a hydrogen technology might be an answer. I, right. I met a person that produces his own hydrogen, solar energy, he runs his car on it. It's all a little bit expensive, but there is a way towards something. Yeah. And at that point, uh, I was following it closely. I deal with video and communication. It was pointed out that a big part of getting this project going is an investment into communicating about these things. And so far, I have not seen any letting go of of, of, I have to say, restriction almost, because either what we're hearing is, are just rumors that there's something out there, or there is really something that is being held back. So what I'm asking is, in your proposal, 
that the government does something, is this included that we open up all the gates, so to speak, of information about technologies? I mean, I think the interesting story about, about information is that, in fact, people have more sources of information than they've ever had in the history, probably in all, in all of human history. I mean, it's like if, if the New York Times doesn't want to run a story about some mm. promising energy technology, somebody else will. So I don't, I don't, I, I, and by the way, I think the Times' coverage of energy technologies is actually excellent. Um, so I don't know, I'm not, I guess I'm not, I'm not seeing that information is being held back about promising energy technologies. Uh, reason why I'm bringing it up is, I mean, Stephen Greer is one person that has been following certain technologies and has asked for disclosure. I recently approached him and said I would like to interview him in video, and his reply was, if you have people that are interested in moving us forward, show them these 20 technologies that ought to be pushed and sponsored, but they are locked away by the big corporations who don't, unless we have money, to pay for the scientists outside of their companies. In other words, there could be companies that have this, co that have this technology locked away. But it they was, don't. It would cut into their profits. They don't have those technologies hidden away. So you're assuming there's... There's just no, there's just no record of like... You, you get, when you have massive cover-ups of some, if you have a massive cover-up by corporations of some secret low-carbon energy source that's inexpensive, there would be whistleblowers and, uh, and leaked memos. I mean, well, they just, are. The whistleblowers are there. Anyways. The ones that were whistleblowing talking about people that have actually been put away. So I don't want to okay. say any more about it. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I share your concern about the cap-and-trade uh, issues with uh, Waxman Markey bill, but I'm also concerned that if it doesn't pass, it will be interpreted as you know people don't really care about this stuff enough. We don't have the political will to do things, and I wonder if you could comment on you know what stance should we be taking about Waxman Markey um, ultimately. And the other is just, I wonder, I, you, we're doing, here in Cambridge, we're doing a lot on energy efficiency and so forth and trying to get people to do things as well as act politically. Um, and I wonder if there's also a value in people doing things like getting out and riding bikes or you know, making their homes more efficient that helps make them feel more positively inclined toward giving the political support to the kinds of things you want to see happen. Um, just on, on the first question, I mean, my, my view is that as long as Waxman and Markey is not legislation that's either going to reduce emissions or support technology innovation, then it shouldn't pass. I mean, the goal is to reduce emissions and drive radical technology innovation so that, because this is a global problem, so that we have the clean energy technologies that the world, especially the developing world, needs. So will people put a spin on that, that nobody wants to do anything on global warming? Well, sure, there'll be a lot of different interpretations of it. But I think it's also an opportunity for you know, this Congress and this president to kind of get clear about what really matters. Um, so the question is, do I think that there's a relationship between riding your bike and washing your clothes on cold and installing fluorescent light bulbs and my policy agenda? You know, I kind of, I think it probably doesn't, unfortunately. I mean, the problem is, is that, and we have an article in this week's New Republic about the green bubble and this question, and I actually think it's, it's probably done the opposite, which is that people kind of write, I think like, my friend Michael Pollan, who's a food writer, had an essay in the, in the New York Times Magazine a year ago, where he kind of goes, you know, we, we really all this stuff about government policy, he's like, we have to change our own lifestyle. You know, it means, so maybe planting a garden won't reduce my emissions that much, but it'll get me reconnected to nature in some way. And I actually think that that sort of thinking takes us in the wrong direction. Um, it actually has us in this idea that like, I mean, here we are, we're in like the, one of the wealthiest civilizations ever, uh, where we live like better than kings lived. Like all those of us that are middle class, you know, live incredibly wealthy lives. And then we kind of, and, and really in a, a whole civilization with buildings and roads and hospitals and sewage lines and electrical systems and, and schools and this whole civilization that was created by burning a lot of cheap energy. And then we're kind of like, well, I'm going to ride my bike and reduce my, I mean, car, it's just sort of a joke, you know? I mean, it's like, it's not like China's 
burning a lot of coal just to make trinkets at Walmart. You know, they're, they're, they're powering the creation of a civilization out of literally nothing, out of rural agrarian poverty. So I worry, now I, I ride my bike um, and I like it and I think it makes me happier and I think I get better ideas when I'm exercising, but I don't actually think there's any necessary correlation to that and supporting an agenda to support technology innovation. Unfortunately, I think the, 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 the association has been <laughs> in the opposite direction. I have a quite specific technological question and a much okay. broader policy question. Okay. The technological question is, and I'm not an engineer, so I may not have got this quite right. Bear with me if that's the case. I have heard that one step that could be taken that would really make renewables a whole lot cheaper overall is to switch the current transmission system from alternative, alternating current mm -hmm. to direct current, mm -hmm. which I believe is technologically possible. Mm -hmm. The price needs to be dropped. Right. If that was the case, then you could have far-flung um, clean energy sources which would obviate the problem you, you mentioned earlier, <clears throat> namely that, <clears throat> say, it's blowing hard on the west coast of the United States, yeah. but it's, there's no wind on the east coast, and so yeah. on. Because then you could transmit energy over a long distance much cheaper, yes. and my understanding is that AC current dissipates, but DC current does not over distance. So the cost does not vary according of transmission. The cost of right. transmission does not vary according to the distance that's being covered. Yeah. If you like, you can comment on that first, and I'll come back to my second question, or shall I give you the you second question? You can have the second question, question too, yeah. Second question, the broader one. I haven't heard you say anything about subsidies to fossil fuels, which uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but they're clearly still very big, and I believe they're in, in some bills that are way, making their way through Congress. And it looks like that's something you would oppose, but I'm not sure. Right. So on the first question of the AC, I actually, uh, this is the Tesla uh, Tesla was the DC guy, right? And Einstein was the, or Edison was the AC guy. <laughs> was, uh, was he the way around? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't. I mean, I, I, what I know is that our grid is woefully inadequate uh, for our current energy needs, and in particular, like if you want to bring you know, wind assets available online. We need new transmission lines. And we also need new grid upgrades to, to make the grid more efficient. So whether those are ACD, I honestly am not sure about the technical specifications of that, but I do support it as part of our agenda to really big investments in upgrading the grid and also in building new transmission lines. Because of course the transmission lines we have were created for coal and nuclear and, and dams. Um, uh, so, so that's a big part of it, and, and actually it's not, the, the big investments to really redo the grid are actually unfortunately uh, not um, at part of the cap and trade proposal they need to be. There were some modest investments in the grid as part of the stimulus, but not, nowhere sufficient. The DOE, by the way, says you need about 60 billion invested in new transmission lines if you want to bring wind up to about 20% of electrical capacity, which is probably what we, what we, what we can and need to do. Um, on the, uh, on the issue of, of, of substitute fossil fuels, it really depends on how you count them. So some people, you want to count the entire defense budget, you know, the war in Iraq, you know, as if you, if you consider it a war for oil, uh, then you could count that. Um, and, you know, I mean, my view is that I would prefer that we did not subsidize fossil fuels. Um, you know, I think they're an incumbent energy source. They've been subsidized enough. Um, I, I don't think there's a very good political, uh, I don't think we're going to be able to, cut those fossil fuel subsidies just because of how entrenched they are. I mean, you just saw how, I mean, the Democrats have been unwilling to cut ag subsidies. You know, everybody knows ag subsidies are terrible, you know, especially for, um, you know, I think for the link to third world poverty is very strong. Uh, they've been very hard to cut. Um, but I will say, I think they also get exaggerated in how important they are in keeping us locked into fossil fuels. Um, China and India, for example, are not choosing fossil fuels because they've been lobbied by big fossil fuel lobbies or, you know, or they're, somehow the government's been corrupted. They're making those choices because fossil fuels are widely available and really inexpensive compared to other energy sources. So, you know, I, would, I love, would I like to see those fossil fuel subsidies cut? I would. Um, do I think it's a high political priority? I don't because I don't think that's actually going to be what, uh, you know, can actually move through Congress, be popular, and, and force the kind of technology innovation we need.
I thought we were getting a beer afterwards. <laughs> yeah, we can do that. I had a different question, though, that was really related to the one you just answered, because I, I, I was going to talk about the grid, and, and isn't it necessary, as well as investi investing in the technology, mm -hmm. given the time frame we have, to also be, at least on the electricity side, investing in a smart grid for mm -hmm. the country and maybe worldwide? And yep. I think you're saying yes. But on the electricity side alone, one of the other means that environmentalists uh, have for uh, addressing that issue is the renewable por portfolio standards. Mm -hmm. And I haven't heard you talk about that and whether you think that's a good idea, mandating that utility companies have an increasing amount of their load generated by alternative technologies that aren't right. carbon-based. They're a great example of, of how um, difficult it is to have uh, uh, your technology policy premised on raising electricity prices. So actually the RPSs that various states have passed have actually been um, really under-implemented and they've been under-implemented because people are always kind of like, well, the agencies need to coordinate better or people are always sort of chalk it up to bureaucracy. But there's just a fundamental, this is still back to the fundamental political economy of carbon, which is that, you know, you, the public is really not excited to spend a lot more money on electricity um, or gasoline, uh, you know, pay, they might pay a modest amount more, but nowhere near the amounts that they need to pay. So even where RPS succeeds, it succeeds in going from, you know, very low percentage of renewables to modestly higher percentages. Of course, where the big cost increases happen are when you start moving renewables as a much larger and larger percentage um, of the of the utility supply to those states because it's, they're so they're currently so much more expensive than fossil fuels. So our view is you know really RPSs are a pretty limited utility. I think we've been much more interested in the feed-in tariff system that Germany has put in place, uh, where you basically guarantee a high price uh, for solar um, and have it implemented. But but um, and, you know people can in install solar and have a guaranteed price for their solar electricity. But again, I think that all of these things still miss, I think, that really would be a much more fundamental and direct driver of technology innovation, which is going to be those investments in R&D and demonstration and those investments in procurement and deployment. I mean, what you get with procurement is really quite special, and I think we've really forgotten it when it comes to policy discussions, which is that you get many firms competitive, competing for a limited number of contracts. So they're actually competing with each other in a transparent way over a long period of time. It's procurement really has worked well in um, supporting these new technologies. And it's only been taken off the table because of this, this ideology of not picking winners and losers. So if I was to sort of suggest a way that we would want to pool our collective capital um, as a public, I, I, would, I would much rather choose those more direct routes. Um, I also think that um, you know, the proposal that we're making, you know, again, it's, it's still, there is an additional investment. I mean, it's going to be something, you know, we think it would be, you know, between $150 and $250 a year per person or a bit more per family. But that uh, we think there's a lot of reason and precedent to believe that once that gets in place, it's going to remain popular. It's actually been really difficult, for example, to, um, to cut the tax uh, on gasoline that supports highway repairs, because people like those investments. They support those basic investments. And I think that the very high levels of support we see from the public to support these kinds of investments to make clean energy cheap could be sustainable uh, even with just a modest price on carbon. OK, perhaps one final question, um, especially in reference to the Waxman and Markey bill that um, doesn't seem to garner a lot of support from you. What is your reading, or isn't there one, of its international impact? One of the um, problems is that there is already a process underway of negotiations, which is proceeding rather rapidly to have a text in June, meetings in September, and a uh, decision in December about carbon. And one of the features of that is that Worldwide, this country is being looked to for a certain amount of leadership. Yeah. If we punt on um, Waxman Markey and there is no chance this time around in this legislative cycle for anything, even symbolically, don't you think that the global honeymoon will be over? with this presidency and that all capacity to appeal to or even work with China and India is lost. 
Well, I think it's important to keep in mind there's actually two international processes underway, one of which is the one that gets the most attention, which is the Kyoto process uh, that will result in a meeting in Copenhagen in December of this year, which everybody feels a lot of pressure to show up. They say, even if we just get something symbolic, which I always think is kind of hilarious. It's like, well, we think the Chinese and Indians aren't going to notice that our emissions reductions program is entirely symbolic. Um, of course they will. They, they, they are capable of, of analyzing and understanding our climate policy. Um, the second process that's underway that I think is much more important is a meeting of major emitters. And uh, it got renamed by the Obama administration because it was actually started by George W. Bush's administration, and they didn't want to, um, they didn't want anybody to think that they were continuing something that George W. Bush had started. Um, but it's actually, I think, where most of the change is, is going to come. Uh, you have 20, about 20 countries in the world that are responsible for 80% of the world's emissions, which makes you wonder then why do, you, do, we really, do we really need to get all 174 nations in the world organized around a global treaty, or do we really want to focus on driving technology innovation through these biggest emitters? Um, that's where I would propose seeing uh, action. I mean, in other words, I think if we have, if we say, look, we're going to bring $50 billion a year to energy innovation, uh, and we want to see other major emitters make that commitment, I think you would start to see a lot more reciprocity there because there's so much opportunity in terms of meeting this growing demand for energy. The country that dominates the new energy sectors of the economy are going to prosper disproportionately. Um, uh, so the whole thing around major emitters gets uh, structured around uh, technology innovation and economic development rather than around pollution regulations and economic sacrifice. So my view is that while everyone's, I think, focused on Copenhagen, um, the real action is going to be by these, these big nations. And I just, I, I just don't believe that we need to go and implement bad legislation because of some arbitrary timing around Copenhagen. I think we, we need to have good legislation that can last the test of time, that will be, that will be broadly supported, that provides certainty for firms, and that really makes you know, those, those large critical investments in the technology. Well, thank you very much, Michael Schellenberger. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>